Hello, and welcome to the history of England. So, uh, first of all, I uh, have a, made a little decision. I love doing this for you wonderful five people or so who are actually listening to this. Thank you. Um, so I decided I'm going to do a, another podcast, actually at the same time I'm doing this one. So starting next week, I'm going to be delving into a slightly different area than what I am doing now. I'm going to be doing uh, Germany under Hitler. It's uh, going to be based on several books I've writ uh, read. Uh, written, huh? Several books I've read um, from Ian Kershaw's Hitler to The Devil's Disciples to Richard Evans' excellent trilogy to classes I've taken. Um, I'm very knowledgeable about this, so the schedule will be next week I will do the first lesson, then the following week I'll come back and do English history, and then the following week go back to another lesson, and the following week, and so on. So for those of you who have paid your money, as it is, um, you get two lessons instead of one. Eventually, maybe, maybe, I will uh, go to on to do a couple a week, but for this now we're going to just do one a week. So I want to start with a story today. It was a beautiful June morning in 793. The island of Listenfern, just off the northeast coast of what is today England. And the island held the monastery of Lindisfern. And it was the base of Christian evangelism in northern England. It often sent and received monks from the Irish community of Iona. Now, according to the Anglo-Saxon chronicles, the year had seen whirlwinds and lightning and fiery dragons, as well as a time of famine. But on this June day, all was peaceful and quiet. The monastery is rich. As English settled into the land, they had turned their backs to the sea. Now, you remember, they had used to face the sea. Now, they had turned their backs to the sea. And many of these monasteries had been established on islands and peninsulas and river mouths and cliffs. They were isolated places. They were less accessible to being interfered with from the politics of whatever section and territory of England they were in. So the amazement of the English at this southern raid from the sea must have been matched by the amazement the Vikings had when they found this vulnerable, wealthy, and unarmed settlement ripe for the picking. Now last time we talked about how the Saxons came. We talked how they were invited, but because they didn't get paid for the job, they stayed up along, stayed. And they invited their friends, and they settled, settled at first in Lower England and then along the northeast coast. And we learned that maybe, maybe they made up about 10% of the population. And they were welcomed by many, but some did fight, including the historical man that has come down to us as King Arthur. We talked about why the Germanic peoples were able to take over more of England because of the plague that ravaged Europe at this time, which dropped the population of England. And I talked to you about how the process of settlement by the Germanic tribes took hundreds of years. Now they formed small folk territories with ranks, but how most English did this, were doing the same thing. Same thing they'd done in the days of yore. And we looked at some of the areas they conquered and how eventually Rome brought in Christianity, their form of Christianity, which destroyed the Celtic Christianity that had originally been part of England, and wedded Roman Catholicism into England, which took about a thousand years to divorce itself once more. So today, we're going to talk about the bloody Vikings and how they helped shape England and made it ripe for the picking of one illegitimate bastard from Normandy in the year 1066, who would change England, perhaps for the good, better, but maybe for the worse. Now, around the year 800, there could be said to be three predominant kingdoms in England, Wessex, Mercia, Northumbria. Now, around these three big kingdoms, the small kingdoms of East Anglia, Kent, Sussex, and Essex. 
Now, the three big kingdoms, they took turns. They were master England at one point, and then they kind of settled down, and another one came master England. But one thing is clear. They were, for their time, modern states had complex administration, complex taxation. They built large communal enterprises and what also keeping a common currency in circulation as a result of the large amount of trade they had. Now these three kingdoms became united because of fire and because of blood and this growth was because of the external threat of a common enemy. Now the story I've just told you can be said to be the start of the Viking Age. It can be said, but in truth the first attackers arrived in England at Portland in 790 with three boats. A official from Dorchester met them. He believed them to be merchants, and he was prepared to escort them to town when they turned on him and killed him. And then came this attack on Lindisfarne, which let the monastery ransack the many of monks bleeding and dead around the church. And a year later, the attackers hid the monastery of Jarar. Now, the problem is that before this, traders and peace had come from the sea. But now, these invaders were coming. Masters of commerce, who had already been getting settled in East Anglia, and who had a culture that many of us remember from school days when we were forced to read Beowulf. They were thirsty for more than peace could bring them. They are from Norway. They are known as Norsemen or Vikings, as the English called them. But they also came from Denmark. Now, the term Viking comes from Vikinger, which means man from the fjords. Fjords. Man through the fjords. Sorry. They came because their own territories were unsettled by the emergence of new centralized kingdoms, which encouraged the formation of warrior bands ready to kill and pillage. They came because Charlemagne, the king of the Franks, was threatening Denmark, undermining the power of the ruling elite. They came because, well, why not? For after all, it only takes a moment of fear to launch a hundred ships. And the Norsemen were perfecting that new bit of technology, the longboat. Now, it must be said in the monasteries that I mentioned, they weren't just random targets, they were chosen targets. Targets of revenge, since at the time Charlemagne was, had declared war on the pagans in the north and were busy destroying their shrines and their sanctuaries, including cutting down their great trees, holy trees, to these Norse people. So in retaliation, the Vikings decided to lay waste to these monasteries, since it is known that this is where the Christian missionaries to Norway were coming from. You could say an anti-Christian crusade had begun. But these two raids are only the warning for the true attack came. We have evidence that shows that many of the people in England were aware that something was coming. They began to take shelter in the various walled towns. In 830, the raiders came to England again, this time for land and slaves and women. They hit the island of Shepherd off the coast of North Kent in 833, a place filled with green pastures and sheep. Now, the Normans were well known for their stock raising, and in the next 30 years, they hit Kent in East Anglia again and again and again. The first sea battle in English history happened around this time off Sandwich, where the invaders were defeated, but the Vikings did not give up so easily. They started to attack London and Rochester and defeated the army of Northumberland. Now, as they saw the Vikings appear every year, the people of England started to notice something about the enemies. Some of these warriors were known as wolf coats, since they wore the skin of wolves in the battle and howled like wolves as they attacked. They held long, kite-like shields of defense and ferocious battle axes for attack. And other Vikings were called burst, um, berserkers. Because they refused to wear armor, they attacked in the throes of blood frenzy. But whatever they were, they were the terror of England. In 865, the raids gave way to invasions. A group of Danes descended upon East Anglia, where many of them had been living after attacks over the years before. These men were here to settle, not attack anymore. Because at the time in Scandinavia, there were more people in the land. They needed somewhere to go. They came in thousands and hundreds of ships. Each ship could carry as most 30 men. So you must imagine what looked like an armada. Like, I mean, 
the whole sea would be filled with these ships. Now, they only stayed in East Anglia for a year. They took whatever caught their fancy, mostly English forces. They established defensive fortresses, which they would use as a place to stay between raids. In 866, they rode away. They attacked York. They captured that city. They'd hold that city for the next hundred years. They didn't spread out. They took over the rest of Northumberland and then rode south to capture Nottingham. The king and the Mercians appealed for help from the king of Wessex. And though Wessex helped out, they ended up losing. In the end, Mercia agreed to pay off the Vikings. And the Vikings said, hey, okay, thank you. We're paying attention now. And East Anglia and Northumberland were now in control of the Vikings. And the two kings were executed. They had their lungs ripped out of their bodies and draped across their shoulders so they looked like eagles full of wings. This is called the Blood Eagle. The Vikings burned the charters. They burned the ornamented books. They burned the Diocesan records. And they devastated the land. In 870, they took up a great fortress in the Reading, and they began to plan an invasion of Wessex. But it's this time that a man rose. Alfred the Great. Now he'd fought the Danes before, his older brother, a man named Althered, and helped the Mercians. And now Alfred was great the king. But his first action was not so heroic. He rode in the battle, was defeated, rode in the battle, was defeated, rode in the battle, was defeated, and finally came to the table and paid off the Danes with money, using the wealth of the monastery of Abinun in the process. From then on, the monks would call Alfred a Judas. The Danes, the Danes went back to London. And for now, Alfred was a tributary king, obliged to take silver from the Danes to mint his own currency. But the Vikings still won in Wessex. It's the largest surviving English kingdom. They captured it, they controlled England. So Alfred took his army, and he shadowed the forces of the Danes as they conducted raids and captured more territory. Until, after yet another defeat, this time at Chippingham, he was forced to Somerset Marshes. And there he built a fortress and marshaled his army for one more attack. And this time, the attack was a victory. In the spring of 878, he led an army out of Somerset. Included in this army with the man of Somerset and Wiltshire and Hampshire. He led them to a place called Egbert Stone, and there he won the great battle of Eggington in Wiltshire against a large Danish army and defeated them. The commander of the Danes, a man named Guthrum, agreed to be baptized, and he took the Christian name Athelstan. So in the end, Christianity had won the war that had become about as much as about faith as land. But why would Alfred and Guthrum agree to enter into holy alliance like this? because they were both of the same blood. Both of them traced their roots back to the royal house of Wooden. Alfred was a Saxon long, long ago. Germanic and the Scandinavian peoples were related. They had much more in common than, say, the people of Devon and Cornwall. In the end, they decided we'll divide England between us. Now, Alfred is not really in a place he could di dictate terms. He won a battle. That's one battle. Many defeats. The Danish forces are still larger and still in Wessex. And so Guthrum controlled all of England from the Thames to the Humber. He was not about to pack up and leave. So it was agreed that what he controlled, he would keep. And he'd be paid money to stop attacking. So what became known as Dane Law was established, which essentially handed over much of northern and eastern England along with a colony of Norwegians in northwestern England, to the Vikings. Now the Vikings came in waves to settle this land. It was poor land, yes, it may be poor land, but it was land. Scandinavia did not have this. England did. Danish farmers would situate themselves by fortified towns they called boroughs, which were manned by the Danish army, from which we have got the term borough. These forts they used for defense and a place to assemble. Now the Dane law was divided into five territories. The boroughs of Nottingham, Leicester, Derby, 
Stanford, and Lincoln. The Danes controlled a lot more than these five areas. There are hundreds of places in England with Danish and Swedish names still. In fact, if a town ends in the word by or Thorpe, it stands a logical, logical reason that the Vikings were once here. Again, just like through the generations, the natives, the native English stayed. Now, Danes brought trade and prosperity to the land. By 1000 AD, the richest shires in England, Norfolk and Suffolk and Lincolnshire, still part of Dane law, or once being part of Dane law. York was one of the richest cities in the kingdom, guarded by strong walls, and digs here revealed streets of narrow packed wooden houses, complete with workshops and warehouses, where jewelers and metal workers lived along with workers of wood and textiles. Everywhere, everywhere there are merchants who traded with Ireland, France, and of course Scandinavia. They traded in pepper and vinegar and fish and wine and salt and slaves. Now Alfred was not being quiet. After this treaty he made, he started rebuilding defenses of his kingdom against further invasion. Throughout southern and western England, he set up a system of fortified towns. He modeled this from those that he had observed in Dane law. He had an elaborate network of each town being created to ensure that no one lived more than 20 miles from a place they could seek refuge. The start of true urbanization within England had begun. Within a hundred years, most of the boroughs had become fully ordered towns with courts and markets. Now, Alfred used Iron Age hill forts like Hastings and Southampton. He used early Romanized settlements like Bath and Winchester. All of these were restored to stronger walls. He also had new towns built with a grid system of streets, and this can be still seen in towns like Wallingford and Crick Lake, both by the Thames, Thames River. Now, Alfred knew that the most important task laying before him was to guard the rivers that flowed throughout his land. Each borough had a large force of defenders who lived with the families to keep him content. And he started to form the first English Navy to keep any further Scandinavian warriors from coming to England. He established an early, an early warning system of beacons set on the hilltops. But this, this, this was not enough. In 896, six years after Guthrum died, another English Danish king invaded East Kent with 5,000 warriors, and they brought their families with them. They had come to stay. Now, Alfred led his army to the region. He quickly forced them to retreat to their forts, but then became aware of another, even greater danger. While he'd been busy at East Kent, ships from East Anglia and North Umbria had sailed around the coast to attack the northern reaches of Devon, and another Danish army was laying siege at Exeter. The Danes had come up with a plan, a simple plan. Keep Alfred busy in the west while we pick off Kent and Essex. Now, over the next months, Alfred defeated Danish forces in the west. He sent reinforcements to northern England. This forced the Danes to give up their attempts to conquer the southeast parts of England. They began to settle down in the territories of East Anglia and North Umbria. Now, it's assumed by most historians that Alfred bribed them to do this. But then again, they may have simply seen his military machine and backed down. But the point is that they backed down. However they backed down, they backed down, and Alfred now took the title Alfred the Great. Now, Alfred saw himself as a Christian king, facing off against pagan warlords, warlords, and since the Danish had tried to destroy the English, he would do everything he could to cultivate English learning, especially the study of English history. He started a program of translating major Latin texts into West Saxon, his language. He made it known he would pay authors to write on subjects that people should know about. He even wrote a few books himself. He translated books by Pope Gregory, St. Augustine, the Venerable Bede, and other authors before his time. He made it known that English people were people of God, blessed by God. But eventually he died. And the throne passed to his son, Edward the Elder, who decided, I'm going to conquer Dane Law. I'm going to make these people part of English society. The Danes, for the first time, were vulnerable. 
since they had settled down. They had always been skillful attacker, attackers. They weren't defenders. Between 917 and 918, Edward's army conquered Derby and North Nottingham. They forced Lincoln to submit. By 920, all the country south of the Humber was controlled by Edward. Within three generations, the Dane law people were Christians. Their old burial customs were forgotten. Of course, since they were closely related to Anglo-Saxons, some of the words come down to us. Sky, die, anger, skin, wing, law, birth, bread, eggs. All of these are Scandinavian words translated into English. Now, not, not all the Danes were conquered by Edward. In fact, it would not be until the 18th and even the 19th century that the conquest would be finally complete. After Edward died, the throne passed to his son Athelstan. Athelstan means noble stone. Now he became father of a great dynasty. Athelstan wanted to rule all of England. His first move was to defeat in battle the kings of York and Dublin, both who ruled over the old Norse trading networks, which now fell crashing to the ground. Athelstan sees York. He subdues Scotland, something that no one had managed to do before him. It's not clear, but he may have actually eaten haggis. <sighs> anyway, Athelstan became the first true king of England. His children were married into the royal families of France in um, Aquitaine, in Germany. Poets and scholars came to his court. He established the first coinage that accepted in all of England. He fixed up many of the towns of England. He called the first national assembly of bishops and lords. He imposed strict control over buying and selling. He set up a code of laws. Under Athelstan, a council of wise religious men began to rule. They supervised all the royal land that was to be used and how royal justice would be administered. They tapped into bureaucracy. They began to issue charters and writs, many of which can still be seen in archives. They made sure that lordship was now given to those who possessed the land, that people on the local land obeyed the lord. For in those days, land was everything. It granted one power. It granted one wealth. It allowed you to dispense gifts. It allowed you to bend people to your will. Those unluckily enough not to own land were either slaves or paupers who could not be trusted. Slavery, in fact, was now a legal punishment inflicted on those who could not pay fines. Poor farmers were known to sell their children. It's estimated that 12% in the English slaves. Slaves were considered live money. They were treated like oxen and sheep. Now by this time the country had been divided into shires. The shires divided into hundreds. The hundreds divided into tithes. All of which were used to expedite taxation. The system would be used all the way to 1974, three years before I was born, when it was finally changed. The shire was a military district but also served the king as a place where taxes could be gathered and justice administered. Each shire had a court and a major town, which is called a borough. Each shire had its own army and was ruled on behalf of the king by the shire reef, which had been corrupted over time to sheriff. Each shire, as I said, was divided into hundreds, which were in theory supposed to be able to support 100 families or supply 100 fighting men in times of war. Each hundred was divided into tithings made up of 10 households. The next 1,000 years, this is how England was ruled. Under Athelstan, the lie of the land it was a self change. No longer was land divided into large estates ruled by king or noble or bishop, which could be thousands of acres large, and which most likely had once been tribal land. Now, parcels of land were granted to the nobles by the king in reward for service. Now, usual grant of land is about 600 acres. The noble would use this 600 acres of land to build his home. He'd organize his agricultural workforce. The nobles became known as Thanes. They created villages on their estates. They located the workers in these villages where they could easily control them. The thane would have a wooden hall residence with small outbuildings defended by a bank and ditch along with a palisade fence. 
he would have a small church built of wood with a bell tower to call the workers into prayer and to divide their day. He had his own court. He'd have a well. He'd have a mill to grind corn. The workers would live in wooden huts along with their livestock, and they would live in fear that the Lord would do something nasty to them. They were made to work the land, even in the coldest, wettest weather. Land, remember, is a great divider now. For two days every week, the laborers would do work for the Lord in return for a house and a small patch of land which they could use to grow food to feed themselves and their families. They harvested and plowed. They carted things here and there. They made hay. They weeded the land. They dug ditches. They sheared the sheep. They constructed the stalls for the oxen. They ran errands. They mended hedges. And they paid taxes to the Lord for their meager, from their meager earnings. Life was very uncertain. Many of them failed. The land was snatched up by the landowner as they went into slavery. Now each villager, as I said, had a piece of land divided into rectangular strips assigned to him by lot. And he would grow in his plot what the community and Lord wanted growing. He had no individual say. If the community ruled that the land was to be used to grow wheat, that's what he grew. If the community ruled that your land is to be kept fallow for a year, he knew he'd have to survive on what he'd saved up, hoping, hoping to live to the next year when he would be allowed to sow his land. And even the towns changed during this time period. The towns were crammed with buildings and workshops, often standing about two feet apart, which allowed just enough room for rain to drip freely from the eaves. The people who lived in towns made glassware and pottery and leather and, and metal. The populations of towns like Norwich and Lincoln, they're about 6,000. London and York were bigger, but the average of about 6,000 people were in towns. But anyone who lived in town was a free man. If you could live in a town for a year and a day, you were free. Your only lord was your king. The towns had been created by the king through royal commands, and he would say, this is how the street was laid. This is how these defenses were laid out. The towns were places to make money through taxes and trade. And mo where money flows in, power stays. Towns became self-governing places. The administrators were seniors or elders. They controlled the courts. They controlled the markets. They filmed guilds together to keep power in their own land. The English parish also comes from this period. Part of the same appetite to control something, really anything. A united kingdom under a powerful king after all leads others to grab what power they could. The church in each village became the parish church. The parish system soon spread in throughout England. It would survive unchanged until the time of King George III. Churches were not only used to sacred services, they are used as places where meetings could be held, as places where markets could be held in cold, wet days. They were used as alehouses for crying out loud. The parish priest was often an illiterate, drunk, violent man, often married, sometimes even being a slave of the local lord who placed them in that church. When not in church, the priests were working in the fields like everyone else, but they had control of the other villages. Villagers, for instance, they could carry weapons. Their job was supposed to be to teach the children what little Christianity they happen to know. Their job was to administer, administer the sacraments and to repeat from the pulpits what they've been told to say, like so many trained parrots. But also, many of these priests practice spoke magic. But regardless, many, if not most English people during this time, wore their hair long. If you pulled it, you could be fined. If you cut it off, it's like cut off from the nose and ear. That punishment was death. Now most people in England, man and woman, wore simple clothes, usually cloaks and tunics of wool. The rich, however, would adorn themselves with rings and brooches. If you were rich, you could afford long flowing tunics ornamented in gold with silk or linen wrapped around the head and neck. 
But regardless where you stood on the social ladder, everyone, for the most part, tattooed themselves on the fa arms and the faces. Regardless where you stood, you would wear bright colors like scarlet and green and pink. Regardless where you stood, you doused yourself in perfume. Remember, there's no baths for the most part, so dousing yourself in perfume keeps the smell off. And most people drank themselves senseless every night. And most are lucky if you live to see 50. 30 was the average age. Death was always watching over the left shoulder. So next time, I'm going to be talking about, again, next time I do History of England, I'll be looking at how England was conquered by William the Bastard. But next week, again, I will be talking about Germany under Hitler. We will be looking at the old tradition under Bismarck. So I hope you can join me. Till then, have a good day, my friends.